in line as of today, at Amazon Prime, you can watch the only movie in which I have ever played a role. Uh, and it's called Complete Works. It's about a Shakespeare contest. And it was written and directed and acted in by my friend Joe Sofranco and Lily Fuller and Adam North. They were three graduates of the USC. Um, and I got connected with them through someone at Country Day. Um, and they asked me to come up and do some dramaturgy for them, and I did. And um, then while I was there, they said, do you want a part in the movie? Because we, somebody can't show up, and we need somebody to play this professor. So I am the first voice you hear in the movie. <laughs> and I have a very small part. I spent 12 hours there, bored to death, waiting for my moment, and then three minutes of acting, and then another few hours of waiting around. Anyway. Um, Tell us again online. It's called, it's at Amazon Prime, and it's called Complete Works. And it's about a Shakespeare dramatic recitation contest. The winners from the various regions go to Italy, and they're trained for a week, and then they uh, are competing to be the winner. And it's very clever, very beautifully done. Um, I just watched it again today. It's delightful. Um, excluding my part, which was serviceable. <laughs> <laughs> so I highly recommend it. It's called Complete Works. It's on Amazon Prime. Complete Works. It's not a play. It's an it's a original uh, film that was written by these three people, two people. And, the, and it's about a Shakespeare contest. So there's, there's a lot of Shakespeare in it, a lot of quotation, but bits, you know. But it's very, um, it's very funny and very clever and very sweetly done. So I recommend it. And you get to see me in my only non-starring role. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about The Tempest. Which is a big job because it's a deceptively simple play. I've always called it Shakespeare's most mystical play. Uh, and it's mystical for a few reasons. One is that it takes place in the amount of time that it takes to perform the play. So it all takes place in one afternoon on this island. Um, and uh, the other thing is it's the only plot that Shakespeare apparently, as far as we know, invented himself. Almost every other play, every other play we know of, he took plots, he took the plot, as in the history plays or Roman plays, or combined plots from other things. But here he seems to have, I mean, obviously he's influenced by various kinds of romances of the past, but uh, here he seems to have cobbled it together himself. It's very well constructed, but it's, it's, um, it's an invention. Third, it's a metaphor for life. The island is a metaphor for the world, and the three hours traffic of the stage is a metaphor for our time in time. And so a lot of deep things are going on in this play in language which is just lambent and simple and, and um, I don't know how to call it, transcendent. So I, it's enough saying that because you don't believe me till I show you and I'll try to show you. Um, in one sense it's mystical because there are several different levels of meaning. Um, as every great allegory uh, has four layers of meaning, um, and as biblical interpretation was done on four levels, so that Dante writes his Divine Comedy with four levels of interpretation in mind all the time, and uh, Jewish biblical commentators read scripture at four levels. You can read Shakespeare at these four levels too in this play, sort of. Um, 
And that's most clearly illustrated by the epilogue, which I will save for Thursday. So cast your minds back to the late uh, 16th century when Christopher Marlowe wrote a play called Dr. Faustus, based on an old legend. It was a very popular play. It was a play about a man who had studied everything at the university. He knew it all. He knew philosophy and he knew history and he knew what passed for science, mathematics. He knew the trivium and the quadrivium and he studied theology and he was bored and he wanted to learn magic. And so he calls up Mephistopheles, the devil, and says, I want to learn about the magical arts. And the devil says, well, that's okay, I'll teach you, but you've got to give me something for it. And what I want is your soul. And so in blood, he signs to give his soul to Mephistopheles after 24 years, during which time he'll have this great magical power. And Marlowe's play shows him using that power. And what he uses it for is, as C.S. Lewis says, girls and guns and money and pranks. He pinches the Pope by the nose and doesn't get seen. He gets Mephistopheles to produce an imago, an image of the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen of Troy. And he goes and has a little liaison with her. And he wants to wall Germany with brass to protect it, but he doesn't actually do that. He puts a, a, um, the head of a stag on some country fellow and makes him run around looking like that. And it's just nonsense. And then after the end of the play, after 24 years, um, he is petrified because the devil's going to come and get him. Uh, but he can't repent. He cannot believe, in other words, in God's salvation. Um, he almost doesn't believe in God, although he believes in Mephistopheles. And he's done all this magic. Anyway, the play ends with his being torn to pieces by the devils who carry his soul off to hell. And it's very terrifying, the last scene, and very instructive. And the name of the character is Faustus, which in Latin means fortunate or lucky. So Shakespeare, at the end of his career, this is, this is the last play he writes before he retires from the stage. Um, and he does write another play called Henry VIII once he's retired. And he does have one more collaboration <clears throat> with Fletcher. Um, but as far as he knows, this is his final show. Um, and I very much believe the epilogue is uh, a proclamation of that in allegorical way, but we'll get to that. So for this last play, he decides he's going to write a play about a white magician, a good magician, not a black magician. He's a black magician is called a goatist. And a white magician or miracle worker is called a thaumaturge. So he distinguishes those as the tradition did. And he's going to give us a main character who's also a magician and learn how to do it, not through the devil, but through art. Um, and his name is Prospero. And Prospero means prosperous. And it's a perfect synonym for Faustus. So it's the antithesis of Dr. Faustus. It's a kind of play on it and an and a, um, inversion of it. All right. So what I want to do is read the first scene of the play. And you'll see a little bit of what I mean about mystical. It starts with a tempest, which is fitting because that's the name of the play. But it's a tempest at sea with a ship. And we see that we're on board the ship. And the tempest is screaming in the heavens. And there's noise of thunder and lightning. And somebody called Master says, Boson. And Boson says, here, Master, what cheer? Speak to the mariners, fall to it, Yarly, and we run ourselves aground, bestir, bestir, and he goes out. In other words, get him moving to save the ship from the storm. And he leaves. 
And that's the last we ever see of the master, although we hear the name master a minute later. So the bosun cheers the troops, the, the sailors, and enter Alonso, Sebastian, Antonio, Ferdinand, Gonzalo, and others. So Alonso is the king of Naples, um, and Sebastian's his brother, and Antonio, it turns out, is Prospero's brother, and they're colleagues, and the son of the king is Ferdinand, and Gonzalo is the old um, counselor, lord. Alonso says, good bosun, have care, where's the master? Play the men, meaning whistle to the men to do their job. Bosun says, I pray now keep below. Where's the master, bosun? Do you not hear him? You mar our labor, keep your cabins, you do assist the storm. So the bosun hears the master. Alonso doesn't. Gonzalo, nay good, meaning good man, be patient. Bosun, when the sea is, hence, what cares these roarers for the name of king? So the roarers, we don't know what those are, but there's noises and screaming is going on, as well as thunder and lightning. Gonzalo, good yet, remember whom thou hast aboard. I mean, there's a king here. You gotta behave yourself. <clears throat> Bosun says, none that I more love than myself. Perfectly good universal truth. <laughs> I'm happy to save the king, but I'm happy to save myself. First, you are a counselor. If you can command these elements to silence and work the peace of the present, we will not hand a rope more. Use your authority. Well, what's wrong with that picture? The counselor is a commander. The king is a greater commander. Can he command the elements to silence? No, because he's also just a human being. So if you can't do it by command, we better do it by art. So get out of our way so we can do it. If you cannot give thanks, you have lived so long and make yourself ready in your cabin for the mischance of the hour, if it so hap. Out of our way, I say. And he goes out. Gonzalo, I have great comfort from this fellow. Methinks he hath no drowning mark upon him. His complexion, now what does complexion mean? It doesn't mean that just the color of the skin, right? It means a whole complex of humors that make up a person, <clears throat> tending towards the phlegmatic or the sanguine or the melancholic or the choleric and whatever mixture thereof. His complexion, his makeup is perfect gallows. That is, he's doomed to be hanged. So I'm, I have a lot of comfort from him because he's the kind of guy that lives to be hanged. So we're not gonna drown. Stand fast, good fate, to his hanging. Make the rope of his destiny our cable. Right? Pull us in by the rope that he's destined to hang by. For our own doth little advantage. If he be not born to be hanged, our case is miserable. Bosun, down with the top mast, lower, lower, bring her to try with main courses, all nautical stuff. A plague upon this howling, they're louder than the weather or our office. This tells us that there's more going on than just lightning and thunder and storm and the shouting of sailors. There are these voices, these, these, uh, this screaming, howling going on in the air. Back comes Sebastian, Antonio, and Gonzalo. Yet again, what do you hear? Shall we give o'er and drown? Have you a mind to sink? Sebastian, <clears throat> first line in the play. A pox in your throat, you bawling, blasphemous, incharitable dog. All right, now, if, if you had a quiz right now, and I said, what kind of man is Sebastian? What would you say? Choleric. Yes, choleric, what else? Is he nice? Do you like him? He's, the guy's trying to save his life, and he's screaming at him, calling him names. Bad names. Work you, then. Antonio, hang, cur, hang, you horse and insolent noisemaker. Sounds like he's a friend of Sebastian, right? <laughs> That's true. We are less afraid to be drowned than thou art. Gonzalo, I'll warrant him for drowning. That is, no, I can, I can assure you he's not going to drown. Though the ship were no stronger than a nutshell and as leaky as an unstaunched wench. Lay her hold, a hold, set her two courses off to sea again, lay her off. That is, turn away from the shore, go back out to sea. And the mariners come in, all lost to prayers, to prayers all lost. What, must our mouths be cold? 
Gonzalo. The king and prince at prayers. Let's assist them, for our case is as theirs. So the king and the prince are praying already. That's what the bosun told them to do. Now, look, if you're on board a ship, who's in charge? The king of the realm? No, the captain of the ship. That's why the king is asking for the master. The king has to obey because it's the art of the seaman that's going to save him. Right? So the, the hierarchy of the universe is intact, but it has subcategories uh, where different people are in charge of different things. I, I uh, try to point that out when I'm talking about Taming of the Shrew, which has got to be one of the most unpopular ideas of our time now, um, <laughs> that, that that the husband is the master of his wife, the head of his wife in St. Paul's words, uh, for spiritual and important things. Uh, but the wife can tell the husband what to do when it comes to the children and women's mysteries and, and uh, so on. So, <clears throat> and any man that doesn't listen to that is just asking for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, the king and prince are at prayers. Now, what does that tell us about them? They are aware of what's going on. They're almost, <clears throat> they're, they're at least in danger of death. And the bosun said, go pray and get ready because we're doing our best here, but it might not work. And they do, they go and get ready by saying their prayers. So <clears throat> Gonzalo wants to join them. And that tells you everything about Gonzalo. And then Sebastian says, I am out of patience. Remember what I said about patience, willingness to bear whatever happens. We are merely cheated of our lives by drunkards. This wide chopped rascal would thou mightst lie drowning the washing of 10 tides. Antonio, negative. Gonzalo, he'll be hanged yet, still got hope. Though every drop of water swear against it and gape at wise to glut him. Confused noise within. They all shout, mercy on us, we split, the ship is splitting up, my wife and children, farewell, brother. Antonio, let's all sink with the king. Sebastian, his brother, let's take leave of him. And Gonzalo ends the scene. Now would I give a thousand furlongs of sea for an acre of barren ground, long heath, brown furs, anything. That is the worst kind of ground, as long as it's dry. The, the wills above be done, but I would fain die a dry death. Okay, so we get the setup of the plot. There's this great storm, the ship's about to crash and be destroyed and everyone's about to die. <clears throat> but there is a great Christian undertone going through this whole thing. Now, who can tell me what storm this is akin to? when people are saying, where's the master? One where Christ is sleeping in the boat. Correct. Christ is sleeping in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. There's a terrible storm. And they come and wake him up and say, come on, miracle worker, like, do your thing. And, and he says, ye of little faith. Okay, so the word master rings through here, like somebody's in charge. And we don't see him except at the very beginning. So what's the relation to the master? The bosun is doing his bidding and the king is doing the bosun's bidding under these circumstances. And the master remains invisible and the bad guys are crabbing and complaining and cursing. Act one, scene two. Miranda comes running in and says, I have suffered with those that I saw suffer. A brave vessel who had no doubt some noble creature in her dashed all to pieces. That cry did knock against my very heart. Poor souls, they perished. What's she made of? Compassion. She cares. Why didn't you save them? Had I been any god of power, I would have sunk the sea within the earth. Or ere it should the good ship so have swallowed and the frotting souls within her. So that tells us everything we need to know about Miranda. Her name means to be wondered at. And Shakespeare will play on it later and have uh, Ferdinand play on it. 
Prospero, be collected, no more amazement. Tell your piteous heart, there's no harm done. Pretty hard to do when you've seen a ship break up and sink to the bottom, apparently. Woe the day, no harm. I have done nothing but in care of thee, of thee, my dear one, thee, my daughter. Okay, and so he then goes on to explain who she is. She takes off his magic garment and puts down his staff. Lie there my art, he says. The direful spectacle of the rack, I'm at line 26, which touched the very virtue of compassion in thee, I have with such provision in mine art, so safely ordered that there is no soul, no, not so much perdition as an hair, be tid to any creature in the vessel which thou heardst cry, which thou sawest sink. Your eyes and your ears mislead you. There's something else going on you don't see, you don't understand. I'm going to tell you some of it. For thou must now know further. You've, you've often begun to tell me what I am, but stopped and said, stay not yet. Well, now the hour's come. So he asks what she remembers, and she's, it's sort of in a dream. She had many servants 12 years ago. So what's the background? He was the Duke of Milan. Shakespeare pronounces it Milan, not Milan, so you don't get mixed up with your meter. <laughs> and his brother, Antonio, decided that he wanted to overthrow his brother and take over. And Prospero has spending, was spending a whole lot of time in his study and not paying attention and not perhaps believing or imagining that people, including brothers, could be so evil. My brother and thy uncle called Antonio, line 66, that a brother should be so perfidious, that is, betraying faith from Fido. He whom next thyself of all the world I loved, and to him put the manage of my state, as at this time through all these seigneuries it was the first, and Prospero the prime duke. We were the best town in Italy, and everyone knew it. Being so reputed in dignity, and for the liberal arts, without a parallel. You know what the liberal arts are? I just wrote a book about it, and you haven't all bought it yet. So the liberal arts are seven, traditionally. Three called the trivium, tri, via, three ways, are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And then the quadrivium, the four ways, are music, uh, geometry, what am I missing? Music, geometry, astronomy, and arithmetic. Arithmetic. Geometry, music, and astronomy. Music is, is what we mean by the arts, because all the mu there are nine muses. So all the arts inspired by the music. So, and, and music was the harmony of all those parts. So basically, the quadrivium is what we would call science, mathematics and science. So first you studied grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and then you studied mathematics and science. And astronomy was simply the application of geometry to 3D space. And music was the application of arithmetic to, um, to everything governed by number. Um, and then theology became the queen of the liberal arts, governing the other seven. So all of that is behind when he says the liberal arts. Those being all my study, the government I cast upon my brother, and to my state grew stranger, being transported and wrapped in secret studies. Now, a lot of people blame Prospero for letting uh, Millen go to, to corruption because he wasn't paying attention. But he wasn't paying attention because he trusted his brother. And we all trust our brothers until we see a reason not to. And he didn't see a reason not to. So thy false uncle, being once perfected how to grant suits, how to deny them, who to advance, and who to trash for overtopping, because power corrupts, and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely, new created the creatures that were mine, or changed them, or else new formed them, having both the key and officer of officer and office, set all hearts in the state to what tune pleased his ear, 
that now he was the ivy which had hid my princely trunk and sucked my verdure out on it. Now, I know none of you would allow an ivy to grow up the tree that you have growing in your yard because you know that eventually it kills the tree, right? You know this? Yes. Good. I just saw a house the other day with ivy, ivy, ivy growing up through this great tree. So if I see them, I'll uh, mourn them. But So my, the, uh, he was now the ivy which hid my princely trunk and sucked the verdure out on it. Sorry? Sure, absolutely. So if Prospero is not to be, he's not to be blamed, but yet he kind of selfishly decides that what he really wants is to go in and be with his books and study and expand his own personal knowledge. Why do you think it's selfish? Well, I was only, you were saying, well, no, he was trusting his brother, and that's true. He was trusting his brother to do the practical work of running the city. The greater he is at the liberal arts and the more profound his study, the greater duke he can be, the better he can be at everything and the better he can help his brother guide the city. So it's not, no devotion to the liberal arts can be successful if it's purely selfish because they're not the liberal arts. Liberal means free. What does free mean? It means free of the um, tyranny of outsiders and free of the tyranny of the lower parts of the self. Appetites and passions. All those things that got King Lear in trouble. So to succeed in the study of the liberal arts is to shed the kind of selfishness that you're imagining he is guilty of. He couldn't have become as great as he was at this if that were his purpose. If his motivation was altruistic or was for the greater good. It has to be because he is participating in that greater good by studying the liberal arts. That's what, that's what liberal means in, that, in this context. Okay, so the brother, it awaked an evil nature, power corrupted him, and my trust like a good parent did beget of him a falsehood in its contrary as great as my trust was, which had indeed no limit, a confidence sans bound. Now, you could say, well, Prospero was unwise to think that anybody, any human being can be trusted. But he thought he could be trusted, so why wouldn't his brother be trusted? He being thus lorded, not only with what my revenue yielded, but what my power might else exact. He credits his own lie. He did believe he was indeed the duke. And he was going to be absolute millen. Me, poor man, my library was dukedom large enough. Of temporal royalties he thinks me now incapable. Confederates, so dry he was for sway, so thirsty for government, for rule, with the king of Naples to give him annual tribute. Okay, he's going to pay Antonio, the, su the pseudo duke, is going to pay tribute to the king of Naples. And do him homage, subject his coronet to his crown, subject his own crown to the crown of the king of Naples, to give him annual tribute, to do him homage, subject his coronet to his crown, and bend the dukedom yet unbowed, alas, poor Milan, to most ignoble stooping. Miranda says, I should sin to think but nobly of my grandmother. Good wombs have borne bad sons. Now here's the condition. This king of Naples being an enemy to me inveterate, an old time enemy, hearkens my brother's suit, promises tribute. He, should, he agrees to extirpate me and mine out of the dukedom and confer fair Millen with all the honors on my brother. Whereon a treacherous army levied, I'm at line 128, one midnight fated to the purpose, did Antonio open the gates of Milan, and in the dead of darkness, the ministers for the purpose hurried thence me and thy crying self. Miranda's going to weep. Now I'll tell you, he says, what's happening now. She says, wherefore did they not that hour destroy us? Why didn't they actually kill us? I mean... They're that bad already. Well demanded, wench. My tale provokes that question. Dear, they durst not. They didn't dare. So dear the love my people bore me, nor set a mark so bloody on the business. 
They didn't want to go that far. And the pe they knew the people loved me. But with colors fairer painted their foul ends. Do you remember uh, Macbeth? Fair is foul and foul is fair. It's, a, it's just a perfect antithesis, both starting with F. Painted meaning, you know, covered over, so pretended. In a few words, they hurried us aboard a bark, a ship, bore us some leagues to sea where they prepared a rotten cut. So they took them away to sea in a ship, which looked to the people, okay, they're going somewhere. <clears throat> and then they dump them into this rotten carcass of a butt, not rigged, nor tackle, sail, nor mast. The very rats instinctively have quit it. There they hoist us to cry to the sea that roared to us, to side of the winds whose pity, sighing back again, did us but loving wrong. What trouble was I then to you, says Miranda. He says, oh, a cherubim. Shakespeare didn't know the Hebrew. He didn't know that cherubim me is the plural, and one is a cherub, <coughs> or cherub. But anyway, she was a cherub that did preserve me. Thou didst smile, infused with a fortitude from heaven, when I have decked the sieve with drops full salt under my burden groaned, which raised in me an undergoing stomach to bear up against what should ensue. For her sake, he faced what was going to happen. How came we ashore? By providence divine. End of play. That's all we need to know. If providence divine is doing everything, just relax. No. Human beings have a role to play. Some food we had and some fresh water that a noble Neapolitan, Gonzalo, oh, that guy that was going to go downstairs and pray with the king, right? Out of his charity, who being then appointed master of this design, did give us with rich garments, linen stuffs, and necessaries, which since have steaded much. So of his gentleness, knowing I loved my books, he furnished me from mine own library with volumes that I prize above my dukedom. Would I might but ever see that man. Ah, now I arise, says Prospero. You're about to, but he doesn't tell her. Sit still and hear the last of our sea sour. Here in this island we arrived, and here have I, thy schoolmaster, made thee more profit than other princes can, that have more time for vainer hours and tutors not so careful. She thanks him. By accident most strange, he says. Bountiful fortune, now my dear lady. Okay, remember fortune in her wheel? So he went down. He was at the bottom. He had nothing. He had his daughter and a rotten carcass of a butt. And they landed on this island with nothing. Except he had some books and he had some clothes. Now fortune is my dear lady. She hath mine enemies brought to this shore. And by my prescience, pre-science, foreknowledge, I find my zenith doth depend upon a most auspicious star, whose influence, if now I court not but omit, my fortunes will ever after droop. I've seen it. I've got to take advantage of this opportunity. And then he puts her to sleep. Boom, she's out <laughs> by magic. And then he calls Ariel. All right, my enemies have come to this land. So the question is, What's he going to do with these enemies? What's the story going to be about? He's got the magical power to cause the storm and to bring his enemies to the island. What's going to happen on the island? And what's going to happen in three hours? Or four? He calls in Ariel. Ariel in Hebrew means the Lion of God. But for the English audience, of course, it has all the associations of air, and uh, Ariel is called in the, in the list of actors um, an airy spirit. So, they're, so they're, you know, the Rosicrucian lore has this idea that there are spirits that inhabit the four elements. Water sprites and airy spirits and salamanders live in fire and so on. Uh, and gnomes in the earth. So this is pre-formal Rosicrucian, but the ideas come from ancient times. <clears throat> so Ariel comes in as an airy spirit. 
Now, how this is going to be acted is always a problem, because when I was young, it would be this cute little girl in a tutu flitting around with feathers and stuff. Uh, and then I worked on a production at the Old Globe in 1983, it must have been, the year after the, uh, the Globe opened after the fire. And Christopher Brown played Ariel, and he was short but strong and athletic, and he just flew around the stage, I mean, almost literally, with, but with great strength and power. And it was a revelation to me, because that's what Ariel really is, very powerful and strong, only subordinate to Prospero's will. All hail, great master, grave sir, hail, I come to answer thy best pleasure, be it to fly, to swim, to dive into the fire, to ride on the curly clouds, four elements, to, the, to thy strong bidding task, Ariel, and all his quality, that means his cohorts, <coughs> his helpers, his other side spirits. Hast thou spirit performed to point the tempest that I bade thee? Oh, so now we know the whole tempest was a, a production of Ariel under Prospero's will. And he tells us what he did. I went up, I went down, I made lightning. Jove's lightnings, the precursors of the dreadful thunderclaps, more momentary and sight outrunning, were not. That is, I was faster than that. Who was so firm and constant that this coil would not infect his reason? Not a soul, but felt a fever of the mad and played some tricks of desperation. All but mariners plunged in the foaming brine and quit the vessel. Then all afire with me. The king's son Ferdinand, with hair up staring, then like reeds, not hair, was the first man that leapt, cried, hell is empty and all the devils are here. So <clears throat> it's not just that there's a storm and the ship is cracking. That's what they thought was happening. Now we know that there were voices and there were spirits and there were devils and it was, you know, chaotic horror. So they jumped. It just reminds me of those people jumping from the, the Twin Towers. Why, that's my spirit, but was not this nigh shore, unlike September 11th, it was nigh shore, close by my master. But are they aerial safe? <coughs> not a hair perished. On their sustaining garments, not a blemish. <coughs> you have to remember that colored garments at the time were ruined by seawater. But fresher than before, and as thou baitest me in troops, have I dispersed them about the isle. The king's son have I landed by himself, whom I left cooling of the air with sighs in an odd angle of the island, sitting his arms in this sad knot. The, sif, the ship is safe in harbor. He's dispersed the fleet. They've gone back to Naples, bound sadly home for Naples, supposing that they saw the king's ship wrecked, meaning wrecked, and his great person perish. Good job, says Prospero. Now, I just want to point out that he set them in troops around the aisle. So the rest of the play is going to be three different groups of people relating to this aisle and to Prospero. One group is going to be made up of Ferdinand alone, the son of the king. One group is made up of the various lords, Alonso the king, his brother, Prospero's brother, and Gonzalo, and several other people, their, their underlings and servants and so on. And the third group is uh, Stefano Trinculo, who find each other having also survived. What time is it? Past the midday. At least two glasses. Okay, so it's two o'clock. So the play started at, you know, 1.30. I look it up and it's been 10, 15 minutes that the play's been running, and it's exactly two o'clock, or just after two o'clock. But it's also the day of the shipwreck. Okay. The time took six and now, so the play's gonna last till six, from two to six. The time took six and now must both, by us both be spent most preciously. Ariel complains, is there more toil? Since thou dost give me pains, let me remember thee what thou hast promised, which is not yet performed me. How now, Moody? What is it thou canst demand? My liberty. Before the time be out, no more. I prithee, remember I have done thee worthy service, told thee no lies, made no mistakes. 
Dost thou forget from what a torment I did free thee? So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we get the past. He was refusing to do the behests of the foul witch Sycorax, and as a result, she put him into a cloven pine and locked it up. And he howled away looking for salvation, and nothing let him out until Prospero showed up and by his magic released him. In the meantime, she died and left thee there, where thou didst vent thy groans as fast as mill wheels strike. Line 281. Then was this island, save for the son that she did litter here, a freckled whelp, hag-born, not honored with a human shape. Yes, Caliban, her son. Dull thing, I say so. He, that Caliban. People have noticed that it's an anagram for cannibal. I don't know if he meant it, but he might have whom now I keep in service. Thou best knowest what torment I did find thee, and thy groans did make wolves howl and penetrate the best breasts of ever angry bears. It was a torment to lay upon the damned, which Sycorax could not again undo. It was mine art when I arrived and heard thee that made gape the pine and let thee out. I thank thee, master. If thou more murmurest, I will rend an oak. Now, why is that worse than a pine? <laughs> because... Anybody ever work with pine wood? Anybody ever work with oak? It's hard. It's tight. It's <coughs> and peg thee in his naughty entrails till thou hast howled away twelve winters. Pardon, master. I will be corresponded to command and do my spreading gently. Do so, says Prospero. And after two days, I will discharge thee. And Ariel has one of my favorite lines. That's my noble master. What shall I do? Say what? What shall I do? Everything, every energy of relief and of service and of acceptance and of desire to please contained in those simple line and a half. Okay, then he wakes up Miranda, Ariel goes off, and Caliban, he calls out to, What ho, slave Caliban, thou earth thou, speak. Why does he call him thou earth thou? Well, we know that Adam, and Adam is made of dust. Um, but if you remember the four elements, there's a hierarchy to them too. So the highest is fire and the stars, and then air, the sphere of air, and then water, and then earth. And it's, it's a vertical hierarchy for the most part, which is why it's... it's uh, a threat that the the flood is a threat. The the water washes over the earth, either in a storm or in the Noah's flood, um, because God has separated them sufficiently so the lower thing can survive in the presence of the higher thing, the water. And and when that that original um, material hierarchy is restored, then the earth doesn't survive. It gets covered in water. So that's what a storm is, the elements fighting each other. So he calls him an earth, the lowest thing there is. There's wood enough within! He thinks he knows what he wants, and he's telling me he's not going to do it, and he's uh, complaining. But not with the exact voice of Ariel, Ariel, I want my liberty. You promised me. A Caliban, there is wood enough within. Come forth, I say, there's other business for thee. Come thou tortoise, when? Thou poisonous slave, got by the devil himself upon thy wicked dam, come forth. Remember, a slave is the lowest thing you can be if, a, if you're human. As wicked dew as e'er my mother brushed with raven's feather from unwholesome fen, drop on you both. A southwest blow on ye and blister you all o'er. It reminds me of King Lear cursing Goneril. For this be sure tonight thou shalt have cramps. You'll be pinched. I must eat my dinner, says Caliban. This island's mine by Sycorax, my mother, which thou takest from me. When thou camest first, now, Everybody wants to make this a colonialization play. It's not. That's not what it's about at all. 
and he's going to show us why it's not. When thou camest first, thou strokest me and made much of me, wouldst give me water with berries in it, and teach me how to name the bigger light and how the less that burn by day and night. And then I loved thee and showed thee all the qualities of the isle, the fresh springs, brine pits, barren place and fertile. So they had this loving relationship, education, raising him up, and service, raising him up. Cursed be I that did so. All the charms of Sycorax, toads, beetles, bats light on you. For I am all the subjects that you have, which first was mine own king. Some king didn't know the sun from the moon. And here you sty me in this hard rock whilst you do keep from me the rest of the isle. Island. Prospero, thou most lying slave whom stripes may move, that is whipping, not kindness. I have used thee, filth as thou art, with humane care and lodged thee in mine own cell till thou didst seek to violate the honor of my child. Oh, ho, ho, oh, ho, would it had been done. Thou didst prevent me. I had peopled else this isle with Caliban's. Is he penitent? No. Then Miranda speaks up. Abhorred slave, which any print of goodness will not take, being capable of all ill. Print of goodness. So one of the great themes of this play is the relation between nature and nurture. And it's a theme that still is with us all the time. You know, your kids are born. How much of what they are is your genes? How much of what they are is your educational efforts? How much is a, some secret relation between those two mysterious things? How much do we have control over? How much do they have control over? How much, what of us is nature and what of us is nurture? Shakespeare is trying to get his mind, our minds, around this question by giving us a Caliban. I pitied thee, took pains to make thee speak, taught thee each hour one thing or other, when thou didst not savage know thine own meaning, but wouldst gabble like a thing most brutish, I endowed thy purposes with words that made them known. But thy vile race, though thou didst learn, had that in it which good natures could not abide to be with. Vile nature versus good nature. He did learn, but he didn't learn enough. Therefore wast thou deservedly confined into this rock, who hadst deserved more than a prison. He deserves it. He had free will. He had the capacity to be better and he chose to be worse, apparently. Otherwise, why would he deserve a prison? He says, you taught me language and my profit on it is I know how to curse. As if that were the great fruit of language, of speech, of human speech. The red plague rid you for learning me your language. He curses them for teaching him how to use language with which he curses. Hag seed hence, fetch us in fuel and be quick, thou art best to answer other business. Shrugs thou malice, if thou neglects or dost unwillingly what I command, I'll rack thee with old cramps. And Caliban says, I must obey. His art is of such power, it would control my dam's god Setibos and make a vassal of him. So he has to obey. All right, so this is not the persecution of the poor wronged native by the invading dead white male of our horrible poisoned imaginations. This is simply justice and the effort to raise up the lower to be higher and the punishment for his refusal to do it and his choice to become, to, to behave vilely. All right, Ferdinand enters. So let's talk about Ariel and Caliban now. What are they? There have never been, there's never been an Ariel in literature before this, and there's never been a Caliban. And there's never really been any since, although there are lots of imitations of Ariel in later um, kind of sentimental romances. 
what's going on here? There is a, a kind of um, artful analysis of human nature going on. There's something in us that wants to be free. And I don't mean free of other people telling us what to do, or even just free of our lower selves, but free of time and space, free of limitation, free to fly with our imagination to become whatever, and to, and to let impulse be everything. It's that feeling you get when you, you know, uh, go to the Bahamas and just want to indulge yourself and do nothing responsible and just be, you know, you want to you wanna lie on the sand, you want to get a massage, you want to drink as much as you want, you want to eat as much as you want. You don't want to worry about the scale, you don't want to worry about morality. You just want to follow your <coughs> impulse. And Ariel represents that longing of the part of the soul that just wants to be liberated from time and space and constraint and limitation and be free. Not to do bad things or even to do good things, just to be. And what is Caliban? Caliban is simply the bestial nature of every human being. That part of us that simply wants what we want, want it now, and refuses loyalty to anything higher than mere physicality and mere passion or affection. He wants what he wants, and it doesn't matter the consequences. It does, there's no such thing as morality. There's just really base desire. Is that a good answer to your question? Yeah. Caliban is in every one of us. How do you deal with Caliban? So at first, because he's a direct threat, he has to be suppressed. So watch what happens to Caliban by the end of the play. And of course to Ariel. Now Ferdinand comes in. But before he does, he's led by Ariel singing a song. It's one of the beautiful things of the world. Come unto these yellow sands and then take hands, curtsied when you have and kissed the wild waves whist. Foot it featly here and there and sweet sprites the burden bear. And then on the next page, full fathom five thy father lies. Of his bones are coral made. Coral, you have to remember, is a very precious commodity at the time. It's going to be precious again because the coral reef is dying, apparently. They tell us it is. I don't know if it is, but. Full fathom five, five fathoms deep, thy father lies. Of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Sea nymphs hourly ring his knell, ding dong, hark how I hear it, now I hear them, ding dong though. What's the, what's the hint of the song? Your father's drowned, yes. But that's not the end of the story. He's gone through some transformation. And the song is only giving us kind of an external version of that. But it's a precious external version. Of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. His eyes have become pearls. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. So that what we thought was an ending, what we thought was death, isn't. Now, we know that his father's really alive, so that the song is kind of strictly speaking true. He's going to be changed into somebody living because he's not really drowned. That's one level of meaning. Remember, I was talking about layer, layers of meaning. Uh, the second layer of meaning is that he's going to be changed morally when he comes to this island and has to deal with the despair about his son and uh, confess his sins and so on so that he's going to be transformed by repentance. 
But of course, at the third level, the mystical level, it's a, it's a parable about the nature of human life, that, that when we die, nothing's, nothing of us completely fades. The soul is transformed into something rich and strange, which we can't know and we can't see and we can't experience. But it's as wondrous in the spiritual sense as it is for eyes to be transformed into pearls or bones into coral. And that's the consoling song that Ariel sings to bring Ferdinand ashore. But he can't see it, where it's coming from. Where should this music be? Line 388. Um, uh, in the air or the earth? It sounds no more and sure it waits upon some god of the island. Sitting on a bank, weeping again the king my father's rack, this music crept by me upon the waters, allaying both their fury and my passion with its sweet air. So the, the storm settles to the tune of this music and my passion, my grief settles. Thence I have followed it, or it hath drawn me rather, but tis gone. No, it begins again. Then he sings again. This ditty does remember my drowned father. This is no mortal business, nor no sound that the earth owes. I hear it now above me. And then Prosser says, now open your eyes and look. And what does she see? Who's she seen in her whole life, except from the deep backward and abysm of time that she remembers, you know, some women servants served her. She's never seen anybody. So who has she seen? Prospero, her father, and Caliban. So now she gets a load of Ferdinand, the son of a king. Okay, young, handsome, princely looking. What is it, she says, a spirit? Look how it looks about. Believe me, sir, it carries a brave form. Now brave doesn't mean just courageous here. It means beautifully decorated, handsome, attractive, shining. But tis a spirit. No wench, says Prospero, it eats and sleeps and hath such senses as we have. Just such. This gallant which thou seest was in the rack. See, I told you nobody was going to be hurt. But he's something stained with grief. That's beauty's canker. Thou mightst call him a goodly person. Or, but he's something stained with grief. If he were not stained with grief, you might call him a goodly person. He hath lost his fellows and strays about to find them. I might call him a thing divine, she says, for nothing natural I ever saw so noble. And Prospero immediately says, ha, ah, good. It goes on, I see, as my soul prompted. Spirit, find spirit to Ariel. I'll free thee within two days for this. So what does he see when he sees her? You can't get away with this now, you know? They play this music and they see each other for the first time in some chick flick and the music drips and then you just go. <laughs> <laughs> but not in Shakespeare's words. Most sure, he says, the goddess on whom these airs attend. Vouchsafe my prayer may know if you remain upon this island and that you will some good instruction give how I may bear me here. Oh my God, look at you. Can you teach me how I'm, I, you must be a goddess. Can you teach me, because this is a wild place. Can you teach me how to behave so I don't offend anybody, especially you, compared to Caliban? Oh, ho, oh, ho. Oh. My prime request, which I do last pronounce, is, oh, you wonder if you be made or no. Are you a virgin? No wonder, sir, but certainly a maid. Miranda means to be wondered at. My language? Okay, there is that whole Caliban language thing, right? You taught me the language and I can curse. My language? Heavens, I am the best of them that speak this speech were I but where it is spoken. I'm the best of them that speaks this Italian, <laughs> or in this case, English verse. We could say Milanese, or rather Neapolitan, because he's the son of the king of Naples. <coughs> I'm the best of them. Not that I speak the language better than anyone else. I'm the highest ranking of the surviving Neapolitans. Prospero, oh, the best? What wert thou if the king of Naples heard thee? What if your father heard you say you're the best? What about him? 
He's higher ranked than you are. He's a king. You're a prince. A single thing as I am now that wonders to hear thee speak of Naples. He does hear me, meaning I'm hearing myself. And that he does, I weep. Myself am Naples, who with mine eyes never since at ebb beheld the king my father racked. I've been weeping the whole time over it. Alack for mercy. Yes, faith and all his lords, the Duke of Milan and his brave son being twain. The Duke of Milan means Antonio in his mind. What? Um, given hierarchy, is the Duke not at a lower order than the king? Yes. But earlier days, they were, there was some indication that they were. You're, yeah, you're right. So the. The king is officially a higher rank than the duke, but the duke is the head of a city that doesn't originally owe fealty to the king of Naples. The king of Naples was just the king of Naples. Not a, you're thinking of Italy. If it were the king or the emperor of Italy, yes. But it's, he, he, so if they both had to walk into a room, the king would go first and then the duke. But that doesn't mean the duke is uh, necessarily subservient to the or obedient to the king. Okay, now they can get along or they can fight. Um, the Duke of Milan and his more braver daughter could control if, if now it were fit to do it. At first sight, says Prospero, they have changed eyes, meaning exchanged eyes. Delicate Ariel, I'll set thee free for this. This is what I wanted. But he accuses him. Why speaks my father so ungently? This is the third man that e'er I saw, the first that e'er I sighed for. Pity move my father to be inclined my way. Verdinand, oh, if a virgin and your affection not gone forth, I'll make you the queen of Naples. Boom, like no doubt. And Prospero says, they are both in either's powers. But this swift business I must uneasy make lest too light winning make the prize light. I want you to think about that as a principle. First of all, it's a principle of education. You know, you're holding the kids' hands and walking backward, teaching them to walk. But if you do that forever till you're doing this, they haven't learned a thing. What do you have to do? You have to let go and take a step back and let them come to you. And they might fall down. And they might say, why are you mistreating me? I can walk fine when I'm holding on to you. Why are you letting go? Because, because this swift business I must uneasy make, lest too light winning make the prize light. Now, that's, that's at the very practical level, I'm illustrating that. But if you think about it in cosmic terms, it might be the answer to the whole nature of the created world that we live in, the nature of time and space that Ariel wants to be free in and that Caliban wants to go his own way. It may be that we don't value reality if we don't have to struggle to it. And of course, it's true of marriage. <laughs> if you don't have to sacrifice anything, you don't value it as much. Or any relationship for that matter. If you're not risking something, if it doesn't cost you anything, you start taking it for granted. Okay, so this swift business I must uneasy make, lest too light winning make the prize light. Now, that puts Prospero above these people as if he were some divinity, right? In saying what I've been saying. And that's kind of what it is. He is, it, it's a, it's, it's not arrogance on his part, it's a dramatic metaphor of Shakespeare's, getting us to see if this island is the world and the people marching around on it, trying to relate to each other, is humanity. And Prospero is this magician who is orchestrating things to a purpose. It's not random. 
Now, obviously, this purpose, the immediate purpose here for Ferdinand, is a, a wedding of Ferdinand and Miranda. So that unites the houses of Milan and Naples uh, and puts an end to the strife between them. So now he says, he accuses him of usurping the name thou owest not. You're pretending to be a king when you're not a king, which is true, but he doesn't know it. Ferdinand doesn't know it. And has put himself upon this island as a spy to win it from me, the Lord on it. You're a spy. You're an invader. No, I'm not. That's not. A, oh, yeah. Come on. I'm going to subdue you. And he can't resist. <clears throat> he tries to resist. Miranda says, there's nothing ill can dwell in such a temple. If the ill spirit have so fair a house, good things will strive to dwell with it. Did you ever know anybody who was really, really beautiful and attractive, who was also thoroughly bad? Is that possible? Or anybody who is really kind of repulsively ugly, who's a saint. It's rare, those extremes, but you know they're possible. And you can see it in little ways. Sometimes the cutest kid is the meanest kid. So why is that? What does that mean? Because the whole Neoplatonic idea, the whole Platonic notion of reality is that the outward should fit the inward. We should make our behavior fit our ideals. We should correspond, everything should correspond, harmony, as it does in the perfect world above the sphere of the moon, where things are all looking like and being what they should be. But here on earth, we have this problem. So when she says there's nothing ill can dwell in such a temple, oh yeah, it's possible. It does, it's not true in this case. And she's defending him from her father based on faith. But uh, we know that he knows more about the world than she does. So he makes it difficult for them. Follow me, speak not you for him. He says to her, he's a traitor. I'll manacle thy neck and feet together. He says, no, I will resist such entertainment till mine enemy have more power. And he draws a sword. And Miranda, oh my God, no, don't hurt him. Because <laughs> she knows that a sword doesn't do any good against Prospero. Magic, right? <coughs> Make not too rash a trial of him, for he's gentle and not fearful. What I say, my foot, my tutor, he's saying to her. And then to him, put, up thy, put thy sword up, traitor, who makes to show but dares not strike. Thy conscience is so possessed with guilt. That's not why he can't strike. He can't strike because Prospero won't let him because of magic. Come from thy ward from your defensive posture, for I can here disarm thee with this stick and make thy weapon drop. Sir, have pity, I'll be as surety. Silence, one word more shall make me chide thee, if not hate thee. What, an advocate for an imposter? Hush. Thou thinkst there is no more such shapes as he, having seen but him in Caliban, foolish wench. To most of men, this is a Caliban, and they to him are angels. Not true. But he's telling her that to make it a little difficult. She says, my affections are then most humble. I have no ambition to see a goodlier man. Nor do we. He's perfect. As she is. Come on, obey, thy nerves are in their infancy again and have no vigor in them. So they are, he says. My spirits, as in a dream, are all bound up. My father's loss, watch how the language reverses here, it's so clever. My father's loss, the weakness which I feel, the rack of all my friends, nor this man's threats to whom I am subdued, are but light to me. All these negative things are but light to me. Might I but through my prison once a day behold this maid. I can bear it all if I can see you once a day. All corners else of the earth let liberty make use of. That thing that Ariel wants above all. I don't care. Space enough have I in such a prison. So what transcends the merely what do you call it, natural or built-in or automatic desire of the spirit to be free 
What transcends that is this power of love and the willingness to live in a prison in the name of it. It works, says Prospero. Miranda says, be of comfort, my father's of a better nature than he appears by speech. This is unwanted, which now came from him. It's, it's, this is not how he normally is. Prospero to Ariel, thou shalt be as free as mountain winds, but then do exactly all points of my command. To the syllable. Okay, let's take a minute for questions or comments. We finished act one. I'm not going to read the whole play. I'm just now going to take us through it faster. But we have another night to deal with some of the stuff. And I'll add some things about Ariel and Caliban. Questions? Do you want to see what happens? Yes. So, uh, uh, Prospero, in this uh, divine approach of all controlling and manipulating the world, so that's just, uh, just as part of the artifice to set. Uh, it's part of the artifice of achieving the goal that he has for the end of the play, which we'll see, which is to reharmonize the fallen world, to, to redeem it through. Um, repentance and reconciliation. All right. Let me say a couple more words about Caliban and Ariel. It seems like Ariel wants freedom. But Augustine had said that fully to serve God is perfect freedom. Perfect service is perfect freedom. And that seems to be a contradiction. What does it mean? The, the nature of the human being is such that we cannot completely serve ourselves independent of anything else and be anything but imprisoned within the limitations of ourselves. We must serve something outside the self. We must serve something bigger, better, more important, truer than the self. And everybody who's living a life, anything this side of despair, is doing that. You may be serving another person. You may be serving uh, a political entity. You may be serving God. You may be serving something perfectly awful, like, uh, I don't know, the Communist Party or something. Um, but if you're not serving something outside the self that you believe is better or that makes you better, then you have a meaningless life and you experience it as meaningless. So that Ariel's relation to Prospero, <clears throat> which begins with, you promised me freedom, I want to be free, depends on service to get the thing you want. You, he has to serve him well in order to get what he wants. He has to serve in order to be free. Now, you can turn that on its head and make it the most vile, ironic corruption that can almost be named, which is the Nazi motto over Auschwitz, which said, Arbeit macht frei. <coughs> Work will make you free. It, it's turning on its head the idea of service and freedom because, of course, they were driving them like slaves and killing them. Um, and no work made them free at all, it just tormented them. So they didn't mean it. Um, they didn't believe in that freedom, really. But they were trying to inspire people to work. And if they couldn't work, they killed them. 
That's not what's going on here, it's just the opposite. It is Ariel's service to Prospero that leads to his freedom within two days. So our higher selves want perfectly to serve a perfect master. That's what we crave. Because that service gives meaning to everything we do. Well, I mean, they descend from that idea, but they're not that in the play. They're not, in other words, the theological structure of the play is in the background, it's hidden. It's not, Shakespeare's not treating Ariel as literally an arch, a biblical archangel, but he is, he is making an analogy between an angel and, and the master, which in this case is Prospero. So if you take it down a couple notches to the, to the Neoplatonic idea of, you know, spirits governing the various elements, then, then it gets mo a little more accurate. R-E-L means the Lion of God, and it's the name of an archangel. But that, uh, Shakespeare may not have known that. What he did know was that it sounds like air, air, airy. All right, so what's Caliban, if that's the case of Ariel? If you worship what is bestial, you are worshiping an idol. You are worship, if you're worshiping your own lowest desires in, in uh, rebellion against rationality and common sense and love, then you are worshiping what cannot deliver meaning. But if you do it, you become vile in every way that Caliban does. So you become guilty of rape and murder and usurpation, which is what uh, Caliban wants to achieve. So it's almost as if Ariel and Caliban are two directions of human possible concentration or devotion. The direction of liberation requires perfect service of a perfect master. The direction of self-worship or self-indulgence or bestiality uh, leads to destruction, ultimately self-destruction after you've destroyed everything else you can. All right, let's turn to act two, scene one, and Gonzalo Alonso, Sebastian Antonio. And what we saw in little in the uh, first scene of the, sh of the tempest, the storm, the shipwreck, is now expanded. So we get nothing but uh, two different visions of what this island is like. From Gonzalo, of course, uh, Alonso's in despair, his son is dead, drowned, and he's miserable. And they're talking about grief. Gonzalo says, you have cause, so have we all of joy, for our escape is much beyond our loss. Our hint of woe is common every day. Some sailor's wife, the master of some merchant and the merchant have just our theme of woe. But for the miracle, I mean our preservation, few in millions can speak like us. Then wisely, good sir, weigh our sorrow and with our comfort. And Alonzo says, shut up, I don't want to hear this. And Sebastian and Antonio are doing nothing but making fun of Gonzalo. So I'm not going to go through all the jokes, a dollar punning on dollar. Uh, who's going to speak first? They bet. Though this island seemed to be desert or deserted, uninhabitable and most inaccessible, yet it must needs be of subtle, tender, and delicate temperance. This is Adrian speaking. The air breathes upon us here most sweetly. And Gonzalo, here is everything advantageous to life. Notice what I'm skipping. Everything they say is negated by Sebastian and Antonio's dark, negative, bitter commentary. 
Temperance was a delicate wench. The air breathes upon us here most sweetly. Aye, Sebastian, as if it had lungs and rotten ones, or perfumed by a, pen, a fen, a stinky swamp, says Antonio. Everything advantageous to life, says Gonzalo. True, save means to live, meaning nothing. How lush and lusty the grass looks, how green. The ground indeed is tawny, with an eye of green in it. So he sees green, they see brown. He sees the clothes fresher than before, they see them ruined by salt water. Why? How is this possible? My thinks our garments are now as fresh as when we put them on first in Africa at the marriage of the king's fair daughter, Clarabel, to the king of Tunis. And Sebastian, yes, fine marriage. We prosper well in our return. Sarcasm, right? They argue about Dido. Alonzo says, uh, you cram these words into, to Gonzalo, you cram these words into mine ears against the stomach of my sense. Would I had never married my daughter there for coming thence, my son is lost. And at my, in my rate, she too, who is so far from Italy removed, I'll never, I ne'er again shall see her. Oh, thou mine heir of Naples and of Milan, what strange fish hath made his meal on thee. Francisco, sir, he may live. And we know he's alive. I saw him beat the surges under arm, under him, sorry, and ride upon their backs. He trod the water whose enmity he flung aside and breasted the surge most swollen that met him. His bold head above the contentious waves he kept and oared himself with his good arms in lusty stroke to the shore that o'er his wave-worn basis bowed as stooping to relieve him. The shore lowered itself so that the sea could bring Ferdinand uh, ashore. Magic. Is it metaphor or is it magic? In Shakespeare's hands, metaphor is magic. <laughs> anyway, he's giving us this impression of salvation, that nature itself helped him ashore. I doubt not he came alive to land. No, no, he's gone, Alonzo says. And what does Sebastian say? Okay, the father thinks his son is dead, and the brother says, Sir, you may thank yourself for this great loss. It's your fault. That would not bless our Europe with your daughter, but rather loose her to an African, where she at least is banished from your eye, who hath caused to wet the grief on it. Prithee, peace. You were kneeled to and importuned otherwise by all of us, and the fair soul herself weighed between loathness and obedience at which end of the beam should bow. We have lost your son, I fear, forever. Milan and Naples have more widows in them of this business making than we bring men to comfort them. The fault's your own. I mean, you know people who say, that's all your fault. Why did this, it's all your fault. So is the dearest of the lost. My Lord Sebastian, says Gonzalo, the truth you speak doth lack some gentleness and time to speak it in. You rub the sore when you should bring the plaster. <coughs> and now Gonzalo has a fabulous image. And they're going to make fun of it the whole way through. And I'll show you why, because it's kind of important. He says at line 143, had I plantation of this isle, my lord? Well, they say he'd sow it with weeds. And were the king on it, what would I do? In the commonwealth, I would by contraries execute all things. I would do everything the opposite of what we're used to. For no kind of traffic would I admit, that means trade. No name of magistrate. Letters should not be known, meaning writing. Riches, poverty, Okay, both riches, poverty, use of service, meaning servants, none. Contract, succession, born, bound of land, tilth, vineyard, none. Okay, no contracts, no inheritance, succession, no borders or boundaries, no tilling the soil, no vineyards, 
No use of metal, corn, corn means grain, or wine, or oil, why not? Metal, you take the ore from the earth, you have to beat it, right? You have to melt it and beat it and change it. Corn, you have to dig the land and grow something. It doesn't just grow by itself, grain. Wine, you have to press the grapes and let it ferment. And oil, you have to press the olives. No occupation. All men idle, all, meaning no work, no labor. All men idle, and women too. But wait a minute, an idle woman means an immoral woman. We're not going to mean that, but innocent and pure. And then he says, no sovereignty. Now, what is this image of? Well, no, because it's still the natural world. Let's go on a little. He says at line 159, all things in common nature should produce without sweat or endeavor. Treason, felony, sword, pike, knife, gun, or need of any engine would I not have. It's Laurie's picture of the United States of America without guns. I'm not. I'm saying we all have this desire in us. But nature should bring forth of its own kind all poison, all abundance to feed my innocent people. I would with such perfection govern, sir, to excel the golden age. So there are two things going on here. There's the Garden of Eden and there's the golden age, right? Everything good in the past and it gets worse as time goes on. Now, one of the ironies is that he says at line 156, no sovereignty. And Sebastian says, yet he would be king on it because he began, if I were king, he said, had I plantation of this isle, my lord, and were the king on it. And then he ends the next paragraph at line 156 saying no sovereignty. So Sebastian makes fun of him for being illogical. And Antonio, the latter end of his commonwealth, forgets the beginning. What are they missing? Yeah, right. Logically speaking, if you were king, you, you, uh, it's illogical to end by saying no sovereignty. There wouldn't be any king. But what's the purpose of his speech? The goal in the imagination is this non-kingdom, this commonwealth of harmony, of perfection, of comfort, of poison and plenty produced by nature that would excel the golden age. He has an image of utopia. And it is something we all long for. If we could live like that, we would certainly give up the labor of growing crops and beating metal into pikes and guns to protect ourselves and conflict, trees and treachery and labor. It's the human version of Ariel's desire to be free to the elements. Alonzo says, prithee, no more thou dost talk nothing to me. So the idealism, the hope, the longing of Gonzalo that he expresses here, made fun of by the cynics and found useless by the king in despair. He says, I do well believe your highness and did it to minister occasion to these gentlemen who are of such sensible and nimble lungs that they always used to laugh at nothing. Antonio, it was you we laughed at, Gonzalo, who in this kind of merry fooling am nothing to you. So you may continue and laugh at nothing still. You are gentlemen of brave metal, says Gonzalo. You would lift the moon out of her sphere if she would continue in it five weeks without changing. You think you're everything. You think you can do anything. You think it's all you. The division we saw in character is now elaborated in their images. So Gonzalo's image, look, this, I, here we are on this island. It's so fresh, it's so good, it's so naturally supportive. Everything seems, let's, let's imagine having none of these awful things that human beings have had to live with. 
Let's be happy and nice to each other. And the, all they can say is, you idiot, you fool, this is... <laughs> and then they all fall asleep by magic. And Sebastian and Antonio are left not falling asleep. They can't figure out why this is happening. And what happens? Antonio begins to seduce Sebastian to do what? Kill his brother and take over Naples. Which would make sense if they were in Naples, even though it's evil. But they're not in Naples. The ship is sunk. They have absolutely no way of getting back to Naples. No hope of ever being found. And he wants to kill his brother and become the king of Naples. Why? Why does Shakespeare set it up that way? This is how foolish it is. This is how foolish it is, even in Naples, to kill the king to become the king. This is what an idiot Antonio was in the first place. And the illusion that it's okay to do that, or there's a reason to do that, if you're there, of gaining power and all influence, whatever, is an illusion when it's seen from the point of view of this island, of this three-hour moment in time, of this uh, result of the tempest, where things now are seen in their, or will be seen by the end, in their true light. He's so used to thinking like this, that he can't look around and say, wait a minute, what's the point? <clears throat> At line 275, he's talking about conscience. But for your conscience, says Sebastian. Antonio says, sir, I, sir, where lies that? If twere kai, meaning a chilblain in my foot, would put me to my slipper, but I feel it, not, I feel not this deity in my bosom. Twenty consciences that stand twixt me and Millen, candied be they and melt ere they molest. Here lies your brother, no better than the earth he lies upon. If he were that which now he's like, that's dead, whom I with this obedient steel, three inches of it, can lay to bed forever, whilst you doing thus to the perpetual wink for A might put this ancient morsel, this Sir Prudence, who should not abrade our course. For all the rest, they'll take suggestion, meaning temptation, as the cat laps milk. Sebastian agrees, thy case, dear friend, shall be my precedent, as thou got smillin, I'll come by Naples. And you know, we're sitting there going, are you crazy? But envy is the driving force, greed, pride, power hunger, whatever you want to call it. It's like the people can't get off the treadmill. Yeah. Right. They can't get off the treadmill. So who are they like? They're like Caliban. Mm -hmm. I must eat my dinner. Right? Well, they're like a lot of people. Yeah, they're like a lot of people. But, I'm, but Caliban is kind of like the distilled essence of this. Yeah. So Ariel steps in when they're about to stab them and sings, while you here do snoring lie, open-eyed conspiracy his time doth take. If of life you keep a care, shake off slumber and beware. Awake, awake. And they wake. And they're drawn, their swords are drawn. So they pretend, oh, we heard wild beasts were... <clears throat> All right, um, Caliban comes in with a burden of wood and cursing. He's a great curser. For every trifler they set upon me. <clears throat> and then enter Trinculo. Trinculo is, what is he called? A fantastic, no, what is he called? Jester, jester the court jester. And uh, uh, Stefano is the butler. Butler means the person in charge of the butts of ale or wine, right? Casks of wine. So the butler is the man who, who uh, is in charge of drink in the court. <coughs> <coughs> so Caliban says, 
This is a spirit. He's going to torment me. I'll fall flat. Perhaps he will not mind me. Trinculo comes in. Here's, there's a storm brewing. <coughs> Wants to crawl under this man's gabardine, this not man. What is it, a man or a fish, dead or alive? A fish, he smells like a fish. Very ancient and fish-like smell. Were I in England now, as once I was, where this play is being performed, and had but this fish painted, not a holiday fool there, but would give a piece of silver. There would this monster make a man. So there are layers of meaning to that. To make a man means to pay, make his living, right? Make him succeed. <clears throat> All he'd have to do is exhibit Caliban. He'd make a mint. <laughs> and then there's an irony. In England, this beast Caliban would pass for a man, a human being. That's how corrupt <clears throat> they are. Any strange beast there makes a man in both senses. When they will not give a doit, that's a tiny little coin, to relieve a lame beggar, they will lay out ten to see a dead Indian. Well, Shakespeare's making some coin on portraying this <laughs> idea of a monster or a fish. But he's also satirizing his audience. I do now let loose my opinion, hold it no longer. This is no fish, but an islander that hath lately suffered by a thunderbolt. The storm comes again. He creeps under his cloak. Misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. I will heal shroud till the dregs of the storm be passed. Stefano comes in, singing, drunk. I will no more to see, to see, here shall I die ashore. That's a very scurvy tune to sing at a man's funeral. Well, here's my comfort. He drinks. The master, the swabber, the boatswain, and I, the gunner and his mate, loved Maul, Meg, and Marion, and Marjorie, but none of us cared for Kate, for she had a tongue with a tang, would cry to a sailor, go hang. She loved not the savor of tar nor of pitch, meaning what a sailor smells like. Yet a tailor might scratch her where'er she did itch, then to sea boys and let her go hang. That's a scurvy tune too. But here's my comfort, he drinks. Do not torment me. Oh, why does he think he's about to be tormented? Because Trinculo is hiding under his cloak right against him and is trembling with fear because he hears this voice of the man he presumes is dead. And Caliban cries out, what's the matter? Have we devils here? Do you put tricks upon us with savages and men of Ind? Ha! I have not escaped drowning to be afeard now of your four legs. So he's crawled in under him and Caliban's legs are coming out this way and his Trinculo's legs are coming out this way and they're hidden. Jonathan McMurtry played, uh, played, no, he didn't play, Steph he played Trinculo. Who was it to play Stefano? To be feared of your four legs. <laughs> this is some monster of the isle with four legs who hath got as I take it an ague. Where the devil should he learn our language? Because Caliban has said, the spirit torments me. I will give him some relief if it be but for that. If I can recover him and keep him tame and get to Naples with him, he's a present for any emperor that ever trod on Neat's leather. So he thinks the same thing that Trinculo did. If I can take him to England, I'll make a mint. And he opens his mouth and gives him drink, meaning ale. This is that which will give language to you, cat. Open your mouth. This will shake your shaking, I can tell you, and that soundly. You cannot tell who's your friend. Open your chaps again. I should know that voice, says Trinculo. It should be, but he's drowned, and these are devils. Oh, defend me. Four legs and two voices, a most delicate monster. So he gives him to drink. Stefano pulls him out, took him to be killed with a thunderbolt, but art thou not drowned? No. Do not turn me about. My stomach is not constant. Why? Because he's nearly drowned, and then he's been drinking. Caliban, these be fine things, and if they be not sprites, that's a brave God, and bears celestial liquor. What converts Caliban to the worship of <coughs> Stefano? Alcohol. I swam ashore, I floated ashore on a butt of sack. 
Here, kiss the book. That means take a drink. Hast thou not dropped from heaven, says Caliban, line 134? Stefano, out of the moon, I do assure thee, I was the man in the moon when time was. I have seen thee in her, and I do adore thee. My mistress showed me thee, and thy dog, and thy bush. Those are all symbols of uh, the moon. The man in the moon carry, has a dog and carries a bush. And the same image is, appears in, uh, in the mechanicals play in Midsummer Night's Dream at the end. Come, swear to that. Kiss the book. That's take a drink. I will finish it anon with new contents. That is, I got more. And Trinculo says, by this good light, this is a very shallow monster. I have feared of him a very weak monster. The man in the moon, a most poor, credulous monster. <clears throat> Caliban says, I'll do for you what I originally did for Prospero. I will show thee every fertile inch of the isle, and I will kiss thy foot. I prithee, be my god. And Trinculo says, that's stupid. A drunken butler to be your god? What are you? I shall laugh myself to death at this puppy-headed monster. I'll show thee the best springs, says Caliban. I'll pluck thee berries. I'll fish for thee and get thee wood enough. A plague upon the tyrant that I serve. Meaning Prospero. Prospero is not a tyrant. This is a lie. I'll bear him no more sticks, but follow thee, thou wondrous man. Why? Because you've got liquor. The most ridiculous monster to make wonder of a poor drunkard. I prithee, let me bring thee where crabs grow. I with my long nails will dig thee pig nuts, etc. No more dams I'll make for fish, nor fetch in firing at requiring, nor scrape trenchering, that's the wooden dish, nor wash dish, Ban, ban, ca, caliban, has a new master, get a new man, meaning servant. Freedom, high day, high day, freedom, freedom, high day, freedom. Is it? I mean, perfect service is perfect freedom. So he's going to perfectly serve this drunken butler, and he thinks that that's freedom. So it sort of matters what you serve in your perfect service. All right, I want to skip ahead to Caliban's. Uh, we'll come back to Ferdinand and Miranda. Yeah, so they're pl in, in Act 3, Scene 2, they're plotting to kill uh, Prospero. His throat, his wizened, his uh, windpipe. But you have to take his books first, because you have to take away his books first, yeah. because Caliban thinks that the power that Prospero has is in the books. Now, the power has come from Prospero's relation to those books, reading and thinking and study. But the power, the magical power isn't in the physical book, but Caliban doesn't realize that. But the, what I want to read is this passage at line, it's Act 3, Scene 2, line about... Um, 123 or so. Ariel plays a tune. He's invisible on a tabor and pipe. And they hear this tune of our catch played by the picture of nobody. And they, you know, they're challenging him. If you be a man, if you be a man, show thyself. If you be a, thou beest a devil, take it as thou list. Forgive me my sins, says Trinculo. <laughs> He's scared. He that dies pays all debts. I defy thee. Caliban, art thou afeard? He's asking his divine Stefano, art thou afeard? No monster, not I, which is a lie, of course, because they're hearing this music come from the air and they don't see any source. And Caliban says this, be not afeard. The isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that if I then had waked after long sleep will make me sleep again. And then in dreaming, the clouds methought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me that when I waked, 
I cried to dream again. It's so beautiful. What does it say about Caliban? Exactly right. There is something in him that can appreciate beauty, that can receive this gift of harmony. So Stefano says, this will prove a brave, and again, that word we, means wonderful, decorated, pleasant, good kingdom to me when I shall have my music for nothing. I won't have to pay for it. As if that were the most important thing about this music coming from the air. And Caliban says, when Prospero is destroyed. So Caliban is war within. There's this beautiful music that comes because Prospero is commanding these airs from Ariel and his quality, his fellow spirits. And there's magic all around. Beautiful, healing magic. And Caliban says, you'll get all that when Prospero is killed and we take over. No, you won't. You know, it's, you're going to kill the, the goose that lays the golden egg. And it's exactly the benightedness of a Sebastian Antonio. Gonzalo conceives this island as this place of beautiful potential and harmony. And all they can do is say, you're an idiot and a fool. In the next scene, uh, Alonso and Sebastian Antonio, Gonzalo, Adrian, Francisco, they all come in. They're exhausted. They're hungry. Alonso's giving up hope. Antonio says, I'm glad he's out of hope. Uh, and uh, Sebastian says, we'll take the next opportunity to do what we planned. They're still plotting murder. And suddenly they hear harmony and strange shapes come in and they bring a banquet and they dance and they invite everybody to come and partake of the banquet. Alonso, give us kind keepers, heavens. What were these? A living drollery. Now I will believe that there are unicorns, that in Arabia there is one tree, the phoenix throne, the one phoenix at this hour. I'm going to believe all this mythological stuff. Whatever, whatever people don't believe, I'm going to believe. If in Naples I should report this now, would they believe me if I should say I saw such islanders? For certes, these are, these are people of the island, who though they are of monstrous shape, yet note their manners are more gentle kind than of our human generation. You shall find many, nay, almost any. They're so nice to us. They're so kind and generous. Of course, they're not people. They're spirits. Ariel's people. Honest Lord, says Prospero, aside, thou hast said well, for some of you there present are worse than devils. Alonso, I cannot too much muse such shapes, such gestures, and such sound expressing, although they want use of tongue, a kind of excellent dumb discourse. Prospero says, praise in departing. Wait till you see what we've got in store for you before you jump to conclusions. Will it please you taste of what is here, says Sebastian? Not I. Faith, sir, you need not fear, says Gonzalo, Mr. Positive. When we were boys, who would believe that there were mountaineers dewlapped like bulls, etc.? all this stuff? All right, you're right, let's eat. And though, although my last, no matter, since I feel the best is past. So they're going to just eat, and boom, lightning, thunder, Enter Ariel now like a harpy. What is a harpy? She comes... Mythological. mythological creature in, from the Odyssey. It's half woman and half bird with talons. And they come and they land on the banquet in the Odyssey and they foul up everything. And they kill people and they tear at them and so on. And the banquet vanishes with what Shakespeare calls a quaint device. So either 
ropes pulled it up, or the trap door opened and it went down, or they took it off on wheels, or whatever. They masked it, and it disappears. And Ariel says this. You are three men of sin, whom destiny, that hath to instrument this lower world and what is in it, the never-surfeited never sea hath caused to belch up you, and on this island where man doth not inhabit it, you amongst men, being most unfit to live, I have made you mad. And even with such like valor men hang and drown their proper selves. So what three men is he talking about? Three men of sin. Alonzo, for treating Prospero as he did. Sebastian and Antonio. You're not fit to live. I've made you mad. And with such like valor, men hang and drown their proper selves, drown themselves. So they draw their swords. You can't talk to us like that. You fools. I and my fellows are ministers of fate. The elements of whom your swords are tempered may as well wound the loud winds, or with bemocked at stabs kill the still closing waters, as diminish one dowel that's in my plume. You might as well <coughs> strike with your swords at the air or the water. You can't hurt us. My fellow ministers are like invulnerable, meaning equally invulnerable. It's not the valley girls like. My fellow ministers are like invulnerable. I've heard, I've heard people do it that way, <laughs> unfortunately. <coughs> you can't get it out of the mind. It's terrible. I shouldn't have said it. My fellow ministers are like invulnerable. If you could hurt, your swords are now too massy for your strengths and will not be uplifted. But remember, for that's my business to you, that you three from Millen did supplant good Prospero. Exposed unto the sea, which hath requited him and his innocent child. For which foul deed the powers, delaying, not forgetting, have incensed the seas and shores, yea, all the creatures against your peace. Thee of thy son Alonzo they have bereft, and do pronounce by me lingering perdition, worse than any death can be at once, shall step by step attend you in your ways. Sounds pretty bad, right? It's the first time they've even thought of Prospero in a very long time, except that Antonio and Sebastian have thought of him, because, oh, I'm going to follow your example. You supplanted your brother, I'll supplant mine by killing him. And now suddenly their guilt, which Gonzalo has mentioned, was, or will mention, I guess, is destroying them. Um, is come back to haunt them in the person of Ariel as a harpy and saying that all of nature is now at war with them. But then he adds this, whose wraths to guard you from, which here in this most desolate isle else falls upon your heads, is nothing but heart's sorrow and a clear life ensuing. What does he mean by that? He means the full meaning of repentance. Repentance involves <coughs> recognizing that you've committed a sin, acknowledging that you have committed a sin, and being sorry about that sin, and wishing you hadn't done it, and resolving never to do it again and meaning it. So heart sorrow and a clear life ensuing. That's the only thing that's going to protect you from the vengeance of the powers. He vanishes in thunder. And then the shapes enter and dance with mocks and mows and carrying out the table. Bravely the figure of this harpy hast thou performed my aerial grace it had devouring. Of my instruction hast thou nothing baited in what thou hadst to say. So it's all coming from Prospero. So with good life and observation strange my meaner ministers their several kinds have done. 
my high charms work. And these mine enemies are all knit up in their distractions. They're now half mad. They're going to be wandering around the island, not Gonzalo, but the, the villains. They are now in my power. Sorry, they now are in my power. And in these fits, I leave them while I visit young Ferdinand, whom they suppose is drowned and his and mine love darling. Alonzo, oh, it is monstrous, monstrous. Methought the billows spoke and told me of it. The winds did sing it to me and the thunder, that deep and dreadful organ pipe pronounced the name of Prosper. It did pa base my trespass. Therefore, my son in the ooze is bedded. That's the reason. It's punishment. And I'll seek him deeper than air plummet sounded and with him there lie mudded. I'm going to go die with him. Sebastian, on the contrary, says, but one fiend at a time, I'll fight their legions o'er, and I'll be their second. So they're not, fall, they're not succumbing to this chastisement. They are saying, I'll, I'll take them one at a time. I'll fight you with my hand tied behind my back. <laughs> they're not quite so silly as Bert Lahr, but it's as silly a claim. Gonzalo. All three of them are desperate. Their great guilt, like poison given to work a great time after, now begins to bite the spirits, begins to bite the spirits. I be, do beseech you that our suppler joints follow them swiftly and hinder them from what this ecstasy may now provoke them to. Ecstasy here means standing outside themselves, right? Madness, wildness of the mind. So they're going to try to protect them from doing themselves harm. OK, let me just. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I don't have time now. So I will do um, Act 3, Scene 1 with Ferdinand to start with next to, uh, Thursday. And then we'll, we'll finish the play and talk about the ending. I have to. I have to make myself leave at least 20 minutes for the epilogue because it takes that amount of time to explain. But we have a couple minutes for me to take questions if you have burning ones or even not burning ones right now. Oh, yeah, it does. Yes, it is. It cannot not be in there. <laughs> you might be looking in the wrong place. I promise to find it for you after. <laughs> if it's not there, then there's a whole lot else that's missing, and there's something wrong with the edition. Someone tore a page out. <laughs> yes, that speech we'll talk about at length, because um, it's not what people think. It's mystical, but there are other things going on after it, so that alter it. Yes? Is the banquet a Eucharistic image? <sighs> hmm. That's a good question. I would say literally no. It's a banquet feast for a king, and the king is invited by the whoever's ruling this isle. <laughs> to a banquet, uh, but it turns into a anti-Eucharistic thing, you could say, because they don't get to partake of it because you can't if you're carrying this guilt with you. So in that sense, I would say yes, if, if you see it as a, as a, a contrast rather than an imitation. Correct, yes, absolutely. And that would be true. Um, I mean, the Eucharist is conceived of as a gift, right? Take, eat, this is my body given for you. So this is also a gift, but it's a gift that's taken away because it's the gift that they would have received if they hadn't deserved to lose it. So um, in that sense, it's like, it's like any, every banquet. But that's the point of the Eucharist, because it's meant to be 
an imitation banquet. So Shakespeare inherits this idea of the banquet from the same source that runs into the gospel description of, uh, of the, the Last Supper and therefore into the church. It's, it's what a banquet already means that's taken up by the church and given that special meaning. And Shakespeare inherits both those. You know, he's, he inherits the, the, I don't want to call it pagan, let's call it pre-Christian or, or natural image of the banquet and the added Eucharistic meaning of the banquet in the gospel. Um, and he can play with both of those things and not offend anybody, which is another aspect of his genius. So, so now the question becomes, is Gonzalo good because he chooses to be good and Sebastian and Antonio bad because they choose to be bad? Or are they uh, uh, somehow victims of their Caliban nature? And what will change them? What, 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 can, what can turn the will to go against the nature. Remember Edmund, well, you weren't here. Edmund says on his deathbed, <clears throat> some good I mean to do in despite of my own nature. So that means there is free will and, and you can go against your nature. Othello could behave virtuously though he is physically the color of the devil. He doesn't have to behave like a devil, but he chooses to make his behavior correspond to his color as, as the Renaissance imagined it. Um, so Shakespeare deeply believes in free will. Yes, these men are responsible. But at the same time, this play is so mystical that that, that question of free will or nature or nurture nature or predestination and free will is, is uh, dissolved or embedded in the play so deeply as it is in us that it, it becomes, um, it's not reducible to a formula. Let's put it like that. And we'll talk more about this Thursday when we can finish the play and see it in a larger picture. That was a long answer to a short question, but it's deep and it's hard. And, and uh, we have this play, he wrote this play because it's a question that doesn't have a simple answer. It, it's an answer that, it, it is a question that is addressed by us through our experience, but cannot be reduced to a simple theorem. And one of the reasons Shakespeare is so great is he brings us into relation with this question and then makes us experience it in a way that is profoundly meaningful, though it isn't reductive. Okay, let's end there and I will see you Thursday, God willing. <laughs>